2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. The Bible reads, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I... I'm sorry. 2 Peter chapter uh, 3, verse 3 through 8. Knowing this first, that uh, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then, uh, that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with uh, the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Lord, I pray as we look into your word about, uh, about your second coming, Lord, I ask, Lord, that we uh, would be attentive, that we would listen. Lord, I pray that we would, uh, Lord, that our hearts would be uh, open to receive what you would have for us. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit. Lord God, that I would preach your truth. Lord, that it would be as a fire shut up in my bones. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, like I said, I want to talk to you for a few moments about the second coming of Christ. I know that for, you know, that I, you know, over the past month and a half, I have not preached, and this is the first time in, you know, probably about six weeks that I've preached, and so Doug wanted to know whether or not we would be out before two o'clock. We'll see. So this morning, like I said, I want to talk to you about the second coming of Christ. In this, Peter speaks of God's time. God's time is always on time, right? For us, we can sit there and say, you know what, God, you're taking too long to do things. But God's time is not our time. He's always on time. In verse 8, we see time as God see it, uh, sees it. The second coming of Christ will be in two parts. This is the part that often confused me because for a while I was going, okay, is Jesus coming back a second time and a third time? He is not. He's coming back a second time. The rapture of the church is the catching away of the body of Christ, it's, you know, literally taking away, and the revelation or the revealing of the Lord is separated by seven years called the Great Tribulation. So that is when Jesus comes back. The second coming, literally, is when he steps uh, you know, uh, his foot on the Mount of Olives, and that is at the revealing, at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Number one, I want to talk to you about the rapture of the church or the catching, of the way, uh, catching away of the church. The next event on... This is the next event on God's prophetic calendar, if you will. That the word, you know, and, and just to get some things out of the way, the word rapture is not found in the Bible. If you type, you know, go online, type in rapture and look at, you know, look for it in the Bible, it's not going to appear in there. Why? Because ra- the word rapture actually comes from the phrase, shall be caught up. It means to catch up, take by force, catch away, or to, uh, or to plug, to claim for oneself eagerly. So in other words, if you look for it in the Bible, it's going to, you're going to see it as caught up. That is you know, what it refers to. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. And I have quite a few uh, verses this morning, so the thing is, is that I may not you know, necessarily wait until you get there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall, uh, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Just so you know, this past week, uh, it, it came, uh, my brother had sent me a message. Actually, it was last night, and I was already planning on preaching on this. But he sent me a text. This is from the Times of Israel. This is the headline that it reads. It says, Trump's nominee for Pentagon uh, chief suggested new temple could be built on Temple Mount. So what does that mean? If they're suggesting that they're going to build it on the Temple Mount or they're going to suggest that they're going to start building it, that means what? Christ is coming soon. And you say, well, they've been saying that ever since, you know, uh, you know Peter wrote this. But the thing is, is that all the events that we see surrounding and everything else with Israel going on, we can tell that it's coming soon. Am I saying he's coming next week? No. Am I saying he's coming next week, next year? No. The thing is, is that I don't know. But the thing is, is that I, I see the events that are happening, the, the events that are taking place, and I say, oh, he's coming soon. 
when I read that, you know, uh, when I sent that to, uh, to Alicia, she came in, she said, even so, Lord, come quickly. Amen? Because the thing is, is that this, you know, this event, all those things, you know, that we sat, have sat there and, and worried about and all those things, we don't have to worry about. Here's the thing is, is that, and I'm telling you that also because of the fact that if you're here, when the Antichrist comes into power and declares himself to be God in that temple, you've missed the rapture. Do you understand that? So I'm telling you that, you know what, if you're not saved this morning and all of a sudden you're on the TV and this guy is up there and he's saying he's God, you better start praying. That's why I'm telling you this because the thing is, is that, yes, for the believer right now, because it hasn't happened yet, we're going to be out of here. But for those that are left behind, you're going to see that and you're going to go, man, he was right. The, the, the rapture is that event in the future, in case you didn't know, when the Lord Jesus Christ will come, as the Bible describes, as a thief in the night, describing how fast and how quick it is, and will catch away all the saved people of the world and take them out of this world and into heaven. It is a time known in the Bible as the blessed hope of the believer. Titus chapter 2, verse 13 says this, says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is imminent. This will be one of the first times that, you know what, I remember back in the 80s when there was a, a campaign ad, uh, ad for Michael Jordan and everybody said they wanted to be like Mike. They wanted to be like Mike, remember? Like Air Jordan? Well, you know what, none of us will have to want to be like Mike because the thing is we're going to have better hops than he ever had. All right, I'll tell you that right now, uh, that we are, that was the first time I've always wanted to be able to fly ever since I was a kid. I wanted to be Superman, be able to fly. I'm going to be able to do it at least once, and that's all I need. I don't need no airplane or anything else. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1, uh, 1 and 2 says this. It says, but of the, the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. It is eminent. It means it happens just that fast. You're not going to have time to sit there and pray and say, Lord, oh God, forgive me for everything that I've ever done. It's going to happen just like that. The Bible refers to it as in, in the twinkling of an eye. It's encouraging because of the, all the hard times that we've had are almost over forever. Everything that we've had, every trial, every tribulation that we've had, every, every uh, tough time that we've had will be over Forever. Amen? It says 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It should be, these words should bring a comfort to you. For the longest time, I sat there, and there would be times where I said, you know, in my mind, I just kept on, something would happen, I'd have a bad dream, I'd have, wake up, and I'm going, oh, have I been left behind? And the thing was that at that time my parents weren't saved and my brother wasn't saved or any of those ones. And the people that I knew that were saved, it was 2 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't call them. So I had to wait until they woke up and then find out, oh, yes, they're still here. I wasn't left in the rapture. It's not, only, not only is it eminent and is it encouraging, it's also exciting. Just watching the Lord work and, and seeing the prophecy fulfill all the stuff, you say, well, how do you know? Well, the thing is, is that one of the, uh, where the Bible points to is always back to Israel. Whereas Israel right now is, is against God. I mean, they've been against God for the past 2,000 years. They've rejected him and everything else. But the Bible says, and I believe it, that they are going to come back. That there is going to be a remnant of the Jewish people. And it talks about the fact of, you know, invaders coming from the north and all those uh, all those different things, and, and them come in there and attack. And there actually, it says that it, eventually what's going to happen, and this is actually going to be in the tribulation, is that all the world is going to attack and be against Israel. And the Bible says that they're going to take a third of them out, a third of the population. But for, like I said, for the believer, it's exciting times because we see things unfold. And it's going to be exciting times, you know, uh, you know, for others as well when they begin to realize and those Jewish people, you know, that remnant are going to be happy 
Because why? Because it's going to be over soon for them as well. It's exciting. Revelation chapter 2, or sorry, chapter 22, verse 20. He which testify uh, these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come quickly. Lord Jesus. The last trump, not Donald Trump, but the last trump, because so many Christians have put their faith and trust in Donald Trump. He is not our Savior. I've seen stupid signs out there saying that the world needs Jesus, but, uh, but America needs Donald Trump. No, America needs Jesus. America needs Jesus. They don't, they don't need a politician to save them. They need the Lord Jesus Christ to save them. But the last trump holds tremendous scriptural truth concerning the rapture. The apostle John heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me in, uh, in the book of Revelation. The first mention of the trumpet speaks volumes concerning its meaning and its use. Exodus chapter 19, verse 13 says this, There shall not, there shall not uh, a hand touch it, but uh, he, shall be, uh, he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be a beast or a man. It shall not live. When the trumpet the sound longeth, they shall come up to the mount. In the Old Testament, what this meant was, you know, there was time for all of Israel to gather in the presence of the Lord. So the trumpet has significant value. Here's the thing is, God is not only coming back for us as Gentiles. He's coming back also for the Jew. God is going to keep his promise that he made to the Jewish people back so many years ago. He does not sit there and lie and say, I'm going to promise and then take it away. He's not done with the Jewish people yet. That's why the Bible, and the only reason why I say yet there is because obviously there are certain you know, Jewish people that, that are, are, are going to be so hard-hearted that they're not going to do it. But there also are Gentile, regular uh, people that are not Jewish that are that same way, that have heard the gospel hundreds of times and still reject it. That's why the Bible, you know, in the New Testament especially, when talking about the end, time, uh, end times uh, prophecy, speaks so much about Israel and the Jewish people. That's why it, it is important for us to not only share Jesus with the Gentiles, which are those that are not Jews, but also with the Jewish people as well. Share it with everybody. Why? The time is short. But let's get back into the fact of the trumps in the Bible, the trumpets. In the, in the Roman days, when a Roman legion moved, there would be three blasts from the trumpets. The first trump would tell the troops to take, uh, take down their tents and, be, uh, and prepare to move. The second trump would alert them to fall in and line up. The, the, the last trump would be the signal to move out. We are leaving, as the Bible says, at the last trump. Amen. We are moving out. The rapture will be fulfilled according, uh, will be a fulfillment in, uh, according to his promises. Before Jesus went to the cross, he promised his disciples that he would return for them. John chapter 14. Verses 1 through 3 says this, let not, uh, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in me, believe, ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go uh, to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what? I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, that, uh, there ye may be also. God, you know, is not playing, you know, with this. He's, the Bible says that, you know what, he's going to go prepare a place for you. That he has all these things. And he says, if I do that, I am going to come back. I am coming back again. He later reaffirmed this promise to the Apostle John. As I said earlier, Revelation chapter 22, verse, verse 20, it says, He which testifies uh, these things say, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Or come, Lord Jesus. When Jesus ascended back into heaven, the angels told his disciples that he would return. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 says this, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they, were, uh, they looked steadfastly toward heaven, uh, towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in uh, white apparel, which also uh, said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here, uh, ye uh, gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, 
shall, uh, so, uh, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He's coming back. Are you ready? The rapture will be in fulfillment of his purposes, not just his promise, but in his purposes. His purpose was that we might be with him. As I read, uh, just read a few moments ago, John chapter 14, verse uh, 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He's going, uh, he's going that we would be with him. His purpose was to receive his bride unto himself. Who is the bride? That is the, that is the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27 says this, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and uh, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Let's talk for a moment about the procedure of the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't know about you, but the thing is, is that I, I remember you know, preaching, uh, well, preaching something similar to this a couple weeks ago at the nursing home. The nursing home was more excited about it, about it than you guys are this morning. I'm not kidding you. They were excited. They're like, you know, I can't wait to get a new body. I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to go. And, all, and some, some of you this morning are going, whatever. Are you not excited about the fact that the Lord is coming soon? I mean, think about it. Those relatives that are dead in Christ, what does the Bible say? The saints of God, you know, the saints of God who have gone on before will rise first. So Aunt Gertrude might be, you know, you know, out of the, you're going, Gertie, where are you going? It says the dead in Christ shall rise first, right? Their soul and spirit is, our, and this is the question that often people, times people had. This question was asked to me. They said, if they're already in heaven, do they have to come back down? in order to get back up into heaven. Anybody else ever have that question? Here's the thing. The spirit, uh, you know, the, uh, your soul has already gone up into uh, their, their spirit, their soul has already, is already with the Lord. Because to, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? So the thing is, is that their spirit is already there. When he comes back, he's coming back for our bodies. And their bodies will uh, come forth breaking out of graves and everything else. Changed. He's going to change that body into, uh, like his glorious body, to look like his glorious body. What does that mean? You'll have a perfect body, a body that doesn't ache, that doesn't you know, hurt because of arthritis, that doesn't hurt because of the, you know, all the stupid stuff you did when you were younger. And as you got older, you're going, man, I was dumb when I was younger. There's not, here's, a, here's something that I'm dealing with this morning and have been dealing with for the past, you know, uh, you know almost a month now. Allergies. Amen. It's going to be a, a perfect glorified body, a body that won't break down. It's not going to be a body that's going to get old. You're not going to have to worry about getting gray hair or anything else like that. Why? Because you're going to have a perfect glorified body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52 says, Behold... And when he says that word behold, it means listen, pay attention, I have something to tell you. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be raised, or sorry, we shall be changed. For the, la uh, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it uh, may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the, uh, to the working, whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 22 and 23. 
For as in Adam all die, even, uh, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in, uh, in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after they that are Christ at his coming. In other words, we will all be made alive with a new body at his coming. So we have the dead in Christ. What about the alive in Christ? First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to, be, uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and, we, uh, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Are you excited about that? Let's talk a moment for about the rapture and truth. What is the, you know, the truth about the rapture? You know, when does it happen? When does it take place? I'll just tell you this at the beginning of this, because some of this, you get into some of this stuff, and it's like technical jargon, and you're sitting there going, I don't really care. What do I need to you know? know? Well, I'm going to tell you this. We are a premillennial, pre-tribulation rapture saints. We don't go through the tribulation. We go before the tribulation. Amen? There are many of those out there that will deny even, even the millennium, even the fact of the thousand-year reign, even the fact of, of his coming in the first place. Second Peter chapter 3, we read it uh, earlier, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You have ones out there. This is the problem with you know, most you know, churches and most denominations is that they don't treat the Bible literally. What they do is they treat, uh, treat it figuratively. Yes, are there sections of the Bible that it's figurative? Yes, but it's pretty plain to see. As I read earlier this morning, that it says that the Lord will come what? As a thief in the night. It does not say that the Lord is a thief. So he's using figurative speech. He's he's coming as a thief thief in the night to show how fast and how quick it is. Because if it's a good thief, they're not going to stay around and sit there and wait for you to get home. They're going to do it as fast and quick as as possible. And I can guarantee the Lord's going to be faster and quicker than they ever were. There's a... uh, there's a branch of this, you know, that believes in a, they call it a post-millennial. A post-millennial. In which, you know, those who teach this view interpret Revelation 20 after the millennial reign of Christ. All right? So that's why they get after or post. And then the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign of Christ. They believe that the thousand-year reign of Christ is not literal but figurative, just meaning a long period of time. They believe that this thousand-year uh, thousand reign, or sorry, thousand years of Christ is currently happening. They teach that this, uh, th- that this world will get progressively better. Is it getting progressively better? Or as the Bible teaches, it's getting progressively worse. I believe the world's going you know, to hell in a handbasket. They believe it's going to get progressively better, believing that there's going to be a revival that breaks out and then that the Lord will return to sit upon the throne of David. They also teach that the forces of Satan will, uh, will gradually be defeated by the expansion of the kingdom of God. As God's kingdom has gotten bigger, as more people have gotten saved, you see Satan all of a sudden just cowering in the corner saying, oh, I should probably go away now. I see it increasing. There's also what they call amillennial. It's millennial with an A in the front of it. Amillennial. Those who teach this view teach that at Pentecost, the millennium began. By using the prophecies of Joel used by Peter uh, you know, about the coming of the kingdom to explain what was happening uh, at the time and, that there, uh, and therefore that the Christian church and uh, the Christian church and um, its spreading of the good news was Christ's kingdom. So basically, they just dismissed the whole millennial reign and the coming back of the Lord completely. This is what we believe, premillennial. Those who teach this view interpret Revelation 20, which sees Christ's second coming as occurring before or pre his literal thousand-year reign on earth, Revelation 19, which some envision uh, to be centered literally on uh, King David's throne in Jerusalem. 
This is a fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. First Kings, uh, uh, First Kings chapter 9, verse 5 says this, Then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised uh, to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. Premillennial is distinct in that it usually interprets a thousand, year, uh, a thousand years that it says in the Bible as a thousand years. Other views, as I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, often interpret this as a figurative term for a long, undefined period of time. Premillennial also holds that the, uh, that the period of a thousand years is after the, gra- uh, the Great Tribulation and has not yet begun. As some of those ones have said, uh, at the day of Pentecost, that's when the thousand years you know, came. But remember, it's figurative. So that's why we're, you know, we're about a thousand years behind it. If you want to you know, learn a little bit more about the pre-tribulation rapture, as far as in what I've been you know, talking about, I'm going to give you some verses, and I will go through these ones a little bit slower. So that way you can read up on it. I've stated some of these already in the sermon. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. I'm sorry, I'm taking medication for my allergies. And instead of, you know, being really, really congested, I'm really, really dry. I hope that my preaching is not. First Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verses 16 through 18. The next one is First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, there are many more, but those are a few uh, you know, that I wanted you to go through on those as well. So at the end of, the, uh, of what some call the church age, is what we're living in right now, and prior to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, and the revealing of the Antichrist. All right, So that's the pre-tribulation rapture, that we won't see the Antichrist if you are, are raptured up. How do, you get to, how do you get to go in the rapture? Get saved. If you're not saved, get saved. If you're saved and yet you've backslidden, get right with the Lord. You say, well, Pastor, that sounds a little bit too easy. Exactly. Just do it. (laughs) And as I said, the correct position is the pre-tribulation rapture. The the church of believers is absent. And how do I know that this is true? That the pre-tribulation rapture is, is correct, that that is the correct position, is because the church of believers is absent in Revelation from chapters 4 through 18. The church then, uh, you know, is mentioned 17 times in the first three chapters of Revelation. So cha- Revelation 1 through 3, it's mentioned, you mentioned 17 times, but then you hit chapter 4 and you don't see them again until chapter 19. Here's the thing. John sees, uh, you know, after John is taken up into heaven in, you know, in uh, Revelation chapter 4, and he's a member of the church, he's called up into heaven. And at the beginning of chapter 4, he looks down on the events of the tribulation, and the church is not mentioned or seen again, like I said, until chapter 19. When, uh, when, the, uh, when the church returns to earth as the bridegroom at his glorious appearing. Why? Why do you think that all of a sudden from uh, chapter 4 to verse 18, the church is not there, but then it shows up in chapter 19? I think the answer is pretty obvious. Is because the fact is is that the church isn't there during the tribulation. She's raptured out to be uh, with her Lord before it begins. The church will be at the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. They will then return to earth in Revelation chapter 19 with the Lord. So the rapture is what? The rapture is when the Lord uh, takes the saints with him, right? They go with him, right, up into heaven, where he comes for the saints. And the revealing, or, you know, the revelation when he actually did the second coming is when he returns with the saints back to earth. The rapture, as I said, the rapture of the church, maybe, you know, this will be better if I actually read my notes and said it this way. 
The rapture of the church is when Jesus comes for the saints, and the re- revelation of the revealing of the Lord is when Jesus comes with the saints. So you have for the saints and with the saints. I'm going to close with this, and I have, and you're going to say, well, how are you going to close with this? Because I'm going to. I'm just going to. And this is not to confuse you, but the thing is that the, Lord, the reason why I bring this up is because I want you to real, uh, realize that this is not something that's just brought up you know, miraculously. Oh, like Daniel talked about it a little bit in the Old Testament, and then all of a sudden revelation you know, showed up. But there actually are, there are actually seven raptures that have ha- that happened in the Bible. Seven types of raptures, if you, if you will. So these are ones that are alluding that this is how the Lord's going to do it. Okay. When I say, you know, types, it's just showing us this truth, that this end times event is going to happen, that it wasn't just something that the Lord pulled out and said, you know what, I think I'm going to come back one day. It happened first with Enoch. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. And Enoch walked with the Lord, and he was not, for God took him. He was walking with God one day, and all of a sudden God said, you know what, you're gone. Didn't die, didn't even do anything, like the rapture. He just got taken, to, he got taken to heaven right away. The second one is Elijah. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold... Now, by the way, the person he's talking to is Elisha, who is his protege, you know, the person he's training to be a prophet. Now, how would you like to be, you know, how, how this is going to be, where you're walking with... Your teacher, your mentor, you're like, hey, man, how's it going? All of a sudden, he's like, gone. All of a sudden, you just see chariots of fire, a horse, and you're going, all right. And that's how it is. I mean, it just ends like that. This is exactly what happened. It says, and it came to pass, as they still went on and taught, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and part of them both asunder. And Elijah went up by by a whirlwind into heaven. He just took him up out of there. They were just walking along, and all of a sudden, chariots of fire and horses of fire just came down and separated them. He's gone. That's how it's going to be at the rapture, isn't it? Jesus showed this. I just read it earlier. Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 9 through 11. And when he had spoken these things, while uh, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in, uh, in white apparel, which also uh, said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye uh, uh, gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He's coming back. But it's right there. And again, I'm going to ask you this question. Are you ready? Are you ready? But realize in this, I mean, realize, you know, uh, what had happened, you know, with this. Is that he wants you to know, he says, behold, two men, you know, stood there. Do you, do you realize that if all of a sudden you see two men just kind of like there, just coming out of nowhere, talking to you, all of a sudden you're going to, I think you're going to stop. That have appeared out of nowhere. The fourth one is, uh, the fourth one is believed to be the Apostle Paul. The fourth one is, you know, to be, uh, be uh, believed to be the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, it says this. It is not expedient uh, for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come uh, to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ, in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Uh, such, uh, such one uh, caught up into the third heaven... And I, uh, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. You ever notice he's, he's saying this a couple times? He says, how, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, uh, uh, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. You say, well, how do you know it? Like I said, many scholars believe that this was when Paul was, was stoned, or they believe that he was actually stoned to death in Lystra. And uh, this is when he was caught up in, uh, into heaven, but God wasn't done with him yet, and so God sent him back to finish the work that God had for him. You say, well, how do you know that? Acts chapter 14, verse 19. 
It says, And there came uh, thither certain uh, Jews from uh, uh, Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having a stone Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So like I said, many scholars believe that he actually was dead, and, the, uh, and then he had this revelation that he was out of body or, or, or in the body. He said he did not know, but he saw this. He went to the third heaven that he, he went there, and God said, you know what? I'm not done with you yet, and he sent him back. And then what does the Apostle Paul do? He goes right back into the city and begins to preach again. The fifth uh, type of rapture that we see is the church. First Thessalonians, you're probably going to get tired of me uh, hearing this verse this morning, but I'm going to read it again. I don't get tired of hearing it. Revela- uh, sorry, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. For this uh, we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord sh- uh, shall not prevent them uh, which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so ever uh, so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going. I know I'm going. Do you? Do you know you're going? The next one, the sixth one is this, is the 144,000 that you read about in the book of Revelation. These are, these are male Jews. These are children of Israel. This is the reason how we know. Revelation chapter 4, ver, uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 7 Verse 4. It says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there, uh, there were sealed a hundred and forty, uh, sorry, a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now here's the funny thing is, is that I was listening to you know, you know, a preacher talk about the hundred and forty four thousand. He says, You want to you want to stump a Jehovah's Witness super quick? Ask them if they're Jewish. Because the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they we're a part of the 144,000. It got kind of, now all of a sudden they say it's a figurative thing. Why? Because there's probably, you know, close to 5 million Jehovah's Witnesses in the world. It's a little bit more than 144,000, right? And the thing is, is that, what does it say? It says, all the tribes are the children of Israel. So there's going to be what? 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that God is going to take up with him, right? In the preceding verses, it talks about the fact that they are, they are virgin men that have never been defiled. That's why I said they're male Jews, because you can't be a virgin man and be a woman. Okay. So like I said, here's the other thing. You know, how do I know that they're going to be in heaven? Because the next time that we see... The 144,000, they show up in Revelation chapter 14. So we went from Revelation chapter 7, now we're in chapter 14, and now they're in heaven and they're not on earth. So something must have taken place to get them up there, right? Let's, let's look at it. Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on, uh, stood on the Mount Sion, with him, uh, 140 and 4,000. Having uh, his uh, father's name written uh, in their foreheads, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder. And I heard, uh, uh, heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung, uh, as, it, uh, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. No man uh, could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the from the earth, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in, the, uh, in their mouth uh, uh, was found no guile, for, the, uh, for they are without fault before the throne of God. 
And so you see right, uh, we see right there that the 144,000, which had to be Jewish, like I said, if you want to you know, stump, a, you know, stump a Jehovah's Witness, take them to Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, and where it says that they are going to be what? The children of Israel. They are not the children of Jehovah's Witnesses. The last, you know, the seventh rapture that we see is the two witnesses. Is the two witnesses. If you want to flip over to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter uh, 11, verses uh, 1 through 13, it says, And there was given, uh, given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, Rise and measure the, t- uh, the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the, uh, the court, which is without uh, the, the temple, leave out, and the measure it, uh, measure it not. For it is given unto the, Gentile, unto the Gentiles and the holy city, shall they uh, tread under, uh, underfoot forty and two months. And I will, uh, I will give power unto uh, my two witnesses, and they shall, uh, they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That's 1,260 days. Uh, clothed in sackcloth. These are the, the, uh, these are the two olive trees and the two uh, candlesticks uh, standing before the God of, uh, God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now think about that. You have two witnesses. You try to hurt them. What happens? Fire is going to come out of their mouth. And it says, and they are going to devour their enemies. I don't know about you. Maybe I'm just like weird this way, but I want to see it. (laughs) Not that I don't believe the word of God. I just want to see it. And it says, and if any man hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Let's continue. Verse uh, 6 says, these have the power uh, to shut uh, uh, shut heaven that it reign not in the days um, of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood. So in this verse right here, this is where a lot of people say that it's Moses and Elijah. Why? Because Elijah was the one that shut up the heavens, for, uh, you know, uh, was able to have it to stop rain, to shut up the heavens so it wouldn't rain. And it says, and to smite the earth, um, sorry, uh, uh, have power over water or uh, waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. We know, if you've ever even seen the movie Prince of Egypt, you know this, this is Moses because of the fact of the plagues and the fact of turning the water to blood and, and, and all of that as well. So verse 7, And when uh, they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall, not, uh, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which uh, spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. If you look at you know, verse 8 where it says Sodom and Egypt, he is referring to Israel. He is referring to Jerusalem. You say, well, how is that possible? Because for one thing, he calls it, you know, the great, you know, he calls it the great city, and that's oftentimes what the Bible says. But here's the thing is, he's likening Israel to Sodom and Egypt. I'll tell you this right now. This is one of the reasons why I believe, you know, another reason why I believe the Lord's coming soon. Israel, if you did not know, is the number one sodomite capital of the world. They have the most homosexuals in the world, is in Israel right now. And God refers to them as Sodom and Egypt. Now think about that. So, you know what, they're, they're committing all these abominations. And it makes it even more, you know, amazing to me is that 144,000 are going to actually be taken out of that. But here's the thing. Like I said, during, you know, the tribulation... There's going to be a third of them that are going to be taken out because everybody's going to come against Israel. There's only going to be two-thirds of the population. So it's narrowing it down quite a bit, isn't it? And then all of a sudden, uh, you see these things um, that are happening. Verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see the, uh, their, dead, uh, their dead bodies three, day, uh, three days and a half and shall not suffer uh, their, their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth Shall, uh, shall rejoice over them and make, uh, and make merry and shall send gifts uh, one to another because these two uh, prophets tormented them 
that dwell on the earth. And after three and a half, the spirit of life from God uh, entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Yeah, the guy's dead for three and a half days, and all of a sudden they're standing up alive again. That's going to mess with people. Verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. Another you know, way of saying rapture in the Bible, or another, you know, this is the same word that is used, is come up hither. It says, And they ascended up, uh, up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. So what we're seeing is the fact that not only uh, uh, did the, you know, the beast come out of the bottomless pit to kill these men, their bodies laid there for three and a half days. Nobody, uh, three and a half days. Nobody messed with them. They were rejoicing that they were dead. They were happy that they were dead. All of a sudden, they come back to life after being dead for three and a half days. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a person, you know, uh, dead for three and a half days come back to life. I've, I know Jesus Christ did. This is gonna, you know, uh, this is gonna terrify a lot of people. And then what ends up happening? God takes them up into heaven. You're going to see more people just flying away. This is the other rapture. Verse 13, it says, And the same hour uh, uh, was there a great, earth, uh, great earthquake, and um, the tenth par, uh, part of the city fell, and in the, the earthquake was, was, sl was slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God, the God of heaven. And so that is the final one that we see, is you know this, this rapture. So out of the... Out, you know, the the Bible shows us time and time again that there are that this is an event that is going to happen. He's been showing us these types over and over and over again that it's going to happen with Enoch, with Elijah, with Jesus, with Paul, with the church, with the 144,000, and with the two witnesses. We're going to see these things happening. And you say, well, you know what? I don't know what all, all that means to me. My one question that I've asked you throughout this entire message is, are you ready? That's why it's important. Because like I said, I believe that the Lord is coming soon with the things that, you know, that we've seen you know, on the news and all those things. And I didn't go into a lot of the things that have been happening and all that kind of stuff. But like I say, the fact that you have a, an official saying, you know what, it's possible that we could you know, build a temple there on the Temple Mount. So why would that be brought up if somebody didn't want it? Why would a Pentagon official from the United States of America care about a, a, a temple over in Jerusalem? What does it matter? Because the Bible is un unfolding itself before our very eyes, and oftentimes we sit there asleep, you know, going, he's never going to come. He's never going to come. Don't be like the scoffers talked about, you know, uh, that we read about, you know, from Peter. Saying, you know what, you know, it just continues how it was, that, you know, that it's always been. They like said, are you ready? Because, you know, it's getting ready to happen. Whether that's tomorrow, today, next year, next month, Next 50 years, I don't know, but you know what? You don't know even if you have tomorrow, next week, the next day, next 50 years. That's not a scare tactic. That's the fact. And if you want to look at it as a scare tactic, good. I hope it does scare you that you get saved and you say, you know what? I don't want to go to hell. That you want to fly, you know. I know Miss Pat, you know, pretty much every, every time we go to the nursing home, she sings, I'll fly away. And I'm sitting there going, amen, I'll fly away. Because you know what? That's, that's the blessed hope that God has given us, that we're not going to have to deal with this world. Whether I die before the rapture or I'm alive when the rapture happens, I'm still going to fly away no matter what. So don't sit there and think, well, you know what? I, I just don't want, I got I to gotta stay alive. I got to stay alive or, you know, I got to go, you know. You're going to be, if you're, if you're saved, meaning that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you put your faith and your trust in his sacrifice, in the blood that he shed upon Calvary to, uh, to take care of your sins, to cover, to remove your sins, that means that you're saved and you're on your way to heaven. If you do that, you're saved and you're flying away. Amen? So if you're saved but you're backslidden, what does that mean? That you, you, know, you begin to do your own thing. You say, you know what? I know, yes, I got saved. I love Jesus and everything else, but I, I just want to, you know, keep doing the things that are not pleasing to the Lord and, you know, that, or I haven't been working for the Lord. I haven't been doing the things that God wants me to do. But you're focused on the fact, uh, on yourself and the things of this world. 
There are people out there that are saved, but they're more worried about the things of, of this world. And it doesn't matter. But the thing is, what we need to realize is that we need to get our lives right. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, it says, Lay up not for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust uh, does corrupt, and where thieves uh, break uh, through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither rust or moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break uh, through nor steal. The thing is, is that if you're saved, yes, you're on your way to heaven, but the Lord doesn't want you to just sit around doing nothing. I had a church member, you know, about a month or two ago, give me a sticker that says, Jesus is coming, look busy. I'd like to change that sticker to say, Jesus is coming, be about the Father's business, or be busy. Don't look busy, be busy. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, and uh, to give every man according as his work shall be. What's God's work? You're doing, you know, you're, you're here at church. You're out talking to people about the Lord. You're teaching, you know, maybe a Sunday school class, or you're doing the, you're, you know, you're doing everything that you're doing is as unto the Lord. And there's, here's the thing is, is that, that those are rewards that we're going to get. Or you can sit back and say, you know what, I'm saved, I'm good. And you're going to get nothing on the, you know, you know, when you get to heaven. Yes, you'll get to heaven, you'll make it. But that's it. And the Bible says that Jesus is going to be ashamed because you didn't do anything with what he gave you. God has amazing plans for you to do, but you have to sit there and say, yes, Lord, I will. I'll do it. I know it's going to be tough. I know that my hands are going to get sweaty when I do certain things. Like when I, if I go up to a door and I knock on it. By the way, we're going to be, you know, 3 o'clock today knocking on doors. Knocking on the doors and talking to people about Jesus. Inviting somebody to church. Your hands are going to get sweaty. You're going to, your heart's going to pound on your chest. You're probably going to get sweatier than I am right now. But God wants us out of our comfort zones to be about our Father's business. Trying to get as many people as we, can, as we possibly can saved and on their way to heaven. If you're not saved today, today is your day. Don't wait any longer. Don't sit there and say, you know, I'll do it later on. I've heard people say, I'll, I'll do it when I have a family, or I'll do it when this happens, or I'll do it on my deathbed. And, or I'll do it. I've heard all the excuses in the books about when they say they're going to get saved. If they see you know, a man standing in a temple declaring that he's God, you're, they're going to sit there and go, oh man, I should have got saved a long time ago. 2 Corinthians chapter two, uh, 6, verse 2 says this, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't sit there and, 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 and wait around and say, I, I got all the time in the world. No, you don't. You, nobody knows how long they have. And so for the next few moments, I want us, I want us to, you know, to begin to ask ourselves, if you need to come up front, you know, up here to, you know, to the altar area, do that. But for the next few moments, I want you to inspect your heart. For one, you know, like I say, are you saved? If you know you're saved, good. Are you doing what God would ask you? Are you backslidden? If you are, get right with God. If you're not saved, come up here and get saved. You will pray with you. We'll lead you to the Lord. And then the thing is, is that be about your father's business. Amen? So for the next few moments, I want you to inspect your hearts, check where you're at to make sure you're ready. Because I want everyone in this room and everyone that's listening to go be with the Lord. Amen?